The following program deals with a controversial subject. The theories expressed are not the only possible interpretation. The viewer is invited to make a judgment based on all available information. Tonight on Sightings, Reincarnation. Is there another life after death? I was a crew member on the Titanic. The latest hypnotherapy breakthroughs could make you a believer in past lives. Then, if your travel plans bring you anywhere near this highway, think again. At that particular day, there were 15 who died. What deadly curse haunts this stretch of road? And our ongoing hunt for proof of ghosts takes our team of investigators to two new paranormal hotspots. Oh my God, it's going off the scale. No, right as I was coming over here, it went off the scale. You just have to say there's something extraordinary going on here. At that point, it started to appear. They had large, dark eyes, claw-like hands. I began sensing and knowing and feeling. I do believe in life after death. I mean, I've been there. We have not scratched the surface of what the mind can do. It's a connection with the unknown. During construction of a highway, the New Jersey Department of Transportation unearthed evidence of an ancient Indian settlement. Native Americans warned that anyone involved in paving over this sacred site would be cursed. A warning that turned out to be more than just an idle threat. Many cultures still maintain a powerful belief that certain places on Earth are sacred and should not, must not, be tampered with. Burial sites are among the most sacred of all places, and there is almost a universal belief that the dead must be left to rest in peace. If they're not, a curse may follow those who dare violate the sacred ground. Some Native American tribes follow these traditions to this day. They warn of grave consequences for those who disturb their honored dead. Members of the Delaware Indian Nation believe this stretch of Highway 55 near Deptford Township in New Jersey was built over an ancient Indian burial ground prompting what has become known as the curse of Highway 55. To us, our ancestors are sacred, and anything that is connected with our ancestors, the whole area to us is sacred, and we do not defile it in any way, and we don't want anyone else to defile it. Well, they just laughed at me. So I raised my hands to the heavens, and I prayed to the Great Spirit, and I prayed to my ancestors. Then all these things happened. I mean, then the winds came up and blew vehicles off the road with people with their workers in them. And I think that at that particular day, there were 15 who died as a result of it. It was not that I wanted the people to die. It was that I wanted the site to be left alone. In the months following the chief's curse, a 34-year-old crewman was run over and killed by an asphalt roller truck. A Department of Transportation inspector died on the job site of a brain aneurysm. A sudden gust of wind blew yet another worker off a bridge, leaving him paralyzed. Within three weeks, many more construction workers and their families seemed to fall victim to the curse. The sheer number of tragedies seemed to be more than coincidence. Workers and their families are still frightened to speak out publicly. The New Jersey Department of Transportation, however, denies that there was anything unusual about the deaths and injuries that have occurred. Highway 55 was already well under construction when Gloucester County historian Robert Harper first heard rumors about what was happening at the site. And it seems that several of the bulldozer operators were in a Deptford tavern and they were loose of mouth. They were boasting about how they had disturbed uh, these Indian braves. Denied access by the New Jersey Department of Transportation, Dr. Harper became obsessed with Highway 55. Unable to stop construction through government channels, Dr. Harper and the Historical Society brought their findings to Chief Wyandaga, the spiritual leader of the Eastern Delaware Nation and a direct descendant of the ancient people who lived on the site in question. They came to me at the shaman and asked me what I could do about it. So I went to them and I talked to them and the state archaeologist said, oh, there's nothing here except some pieces of pottery and items of that nature. 
The Department of Transportation admits they were surprised to find what they believe is an Indian campsite. They pulled thousands of artifacts out of the site, but deny finding evidence of human remains. Most of the time we know what's out there. But in case once in a while there is something that we do miss, we do have a procedure and it works. Construction was temporarily halted and that site was also investigated. This is one of the earliest artifacts we found. It's either a knife blade or a spear point. This dates from roughly about 6,000 BC. The few bone pieces we did find, and I'll be glad to show them to you, are not human. They happen to be deer. So there was absolutely no evidence of cemeteries or any other type of burial. Chief Wyandaga doesn't agree. He believes the site is sacred, and anyone who disturbs it is cursed. I said, if there was a village, then within a hundred yards in one direction or the other, there would have to be a burial site because after all, they didn't have horses, they didn't have any other means of transportation, so they had to carry the body and bury it. The soils are fairly acidic and organic remains do not last very long, two, three hundred years tops before they completely disintegrate into the soil. So I said, well, even if there's no bones left, there still was a burial site. So how do you know? I said, how do I know? I said, these are my ancestors. That's how I know. The bones are no longer there. The descendants are no longer there. We do not know if somebody was buried there or not. And I said, how would you like it if I sent some of my warriors with bulldozers and bulldozed your grandparents up? What's done has been done. And what's been done can't be undone. Highway 55 has been completed. Whether or not it was built on sacred Delaware Indian burial ground may never be known. But there are still disturbing questions. Is there a connection between Wyandaka's curse and the documented tragedies that occurred along Highway 55? And will the curse continue to claim victims here? As far as I was concerned, it wasn't a curse. It was a prayer. I prayed to the Great Spirit, and he answered me. Coming up next, reincarnation. Is there another life after death? I was a crew member on the Titanic. The latest hypnotherapy breakthroughs could make you a believer in past lives. And our ongoing ghost investigation takes us to two new paranormal hotspots. You just have to say there's something extraordinary going on here. What happens to us after we die? Many religions believe that we're reincarnated, that the soul is transferred to another body and we live again. And now, some modern researchers believe proof of reincarnation exists. Through hypnosis, many people claim they can recall past lives. I absolutely believe in reincarnation. I was a Japanese man. I've been a silversmith. I've been, uh, had many past lives as warriors. I worked a printing press, and this was in uh, about the 1780s. Over 3,000 people claim to have recalled past lives working with author and reincarnation teacher Betty Bender. Reincarnation is the process by which the soul, which is our spiritual essence, at the end of a lifetime when the body dies, leaves that lifetime, leaves that body, gets into a new body and starts a new lifetime. Does reincarnation exist? Under hypnosis, Betty's clients try to reach back in time to a time before they were born. They are searching their unconscious for evidence of past lives. The technique is called regression therapy. Once hypnotized, subjects seem to relive previous incarnations, recalling historical events, people, and foreign places they have no knowledge of. Subjects say their previous lives come to them like snapshots from the past. The philosophy behind reincarnation is that the soul has chosen to get into a physical body in order to learn something. We are choosing to incarnate in each lifetime because we have certain lessons to learn in each lifetime. Regression therapists work with people who want to go back in time and explore the possibility that they've lived before. 
The first step involves total relaxation of mind and body. Now take a stream of white light down through the top of your head. Let it run through your body, head to toe, as if you were sitting under a waterfall. Some people try past life therapy out of curiosity. Others hope to learn if problems in this life are linked to traumatic events in a past life. One of Betty's clients sought help for his clinical depression after traditional therapy failed. Betty and I went back to a past life when I was happy flying, which happened to be a World War II fighter pilot. So for instance, something that gave me pain or gives me pain during this lifetime is cause for exploration of past lives. I'm in the cockpit, October 3rd, 1940. Down below us, maybe uh, three or 4,000 feet are some, uh, looks like German fighter planes. I begin firing my gun. And just as I do so, I, I feel some sensation, like some thudding into my plane. I am hit, but I don't feel pain. I'm just incapacitated in my plane. Uh, I, I can't, I, I've lost control of my plane. I'm at full throttle going straight into the ocean. Disintegrated. I'm floating. In 1988, my entire world fell apart and I went through uh, some traditional therapy. It was at that point that I was really grasping at straws to figure out what I was gonna do. I guess you would call it a clinical depression. And it was at the point that I started working with Betty, um, incorporating this, this therapy, that things really began to change. Daryl Rooney had a profound fear of drowning. Working with Betty Bender, he recalled past events that could explain his debilitating phobia. Holding on to a railing. It's cold and wet. I'm angry and frightened because I'm stuck here. I'm looking out into the ocean and I know that all the lifeboats are out there. I was a crew member on the Titanic down in the engine room. The ship is in trouble. And I don't want to die. I don't want to go down with this ship. I can remember screaming all around me, and then all of a sudden, things turning upside down. And the most disturbing thing is timber creaking and stretching and cracking in ways that it's not supposed to. Up until then, I've felt a sense of gravity, and now it's all upside down. And ropes, I'm caught up in ropes. I'm being dragged under. I'm. I'm I, I can feel a rope wrapped around here, and I can see portholes of the ship. I'm being pulled under by these ropes. I'm being pulled down with the ship. And this is a really frightening thing. I watched myself tied up in the ropes go down, 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 and I can see the stern of the ship, and it disappears into this black fog water. The Titanic sank in 1912. 40 years before Darrell was supposedly reborn in his present life. During regression, he was able to reveal the name of the sailor his soul had previously inhabited. I just opened my mouth and this word came out, Brooks. Brooks, my name was Brooks. We later got the crew list and found the names on the crew list, which was astounding to me. Uh, that moment of seeing them on there just made me think, this is real. Daryl has drowned in three past lives uh, that I'm aware of, and they were all in the middle of an ocean, and they were all one after another. His death scene is a very profound one because he had not expected to die. It was not his intention as a soul. He was furious. There was all of this terror and all of this emotion during the regression talking about this. And the minute that I separated, all the emotion went away. And I was at peace, and I was calm, and you know, I felt tranquil. When you go to most religions in the world, you'll find that reincarnation is something that most people have been brought up with, the Buddhists, the Hindus, a lot of others. Early Christian fathers and the early Hebrews believed in reincarnation. 
The ancient belief in reincarnation is challenged by modern science. But while regression therapy may not be proof of past lives, it has been successful in helping some people deal with problems in this life. Coming up next, our ongoing ghost research takes our team of investigators to two new paranormal hotspots. Oh my God, it's going off the scale. Now, right as I was coming over here, it went off the scale. Houston haunting phenomena. Tonight, we follow director Lloyd Auerbach as he investigates two reported hauntings and attempts to gather evidence that ghosts actually exist. Ghostbusters was one of the first films that really hit the entire public consciousness with a comedy that was clearly not real. We know that stuff's not real, guys. We know that there's not a marshmallow man walking down Central Park West. What do you really do? Until his death, Tony was everyone's favorite bartender at the Banta Inn near San Francisco. Locals believe his spirit haunts the restaurant still. But Tony's not a frightening, malicious ghost. His trademark is mischief. There was a fellow staring at me there. I went through the, the door of the kitchen and uh, he was gone. I saw a figure in the mirror and I turned to look at the floor where that person should have been standing and there was nothing and all there. All of a sudden I felt this, like somebody took your finger up the back of my leg all the way up and I turned around and there was nobody there. And it was after that, the guy here right next to me tipped over, spun around three times. The guy then and all of a sudden up. the CDs started flipping by themselves. He just flipped a couple times. He, played, he loved Patsy Klein and it would come on all the time. Ghosts tend to react to situations as if they were people, living and breathing people. One of the reasons is they don't know they're dead. They're in total denial. We have a lot of physical things happening that seem to relate to Tony's behavior when he was alive. One of the things that Tony was apparently uh, fond of doing was playing with the money in the cash register and stacking the change so that it was a nice orderly sex in the change bin. And here, when you just toss money in a change bin, obviously close the door open it, and open it back and forth, it's not going to stack automatically. And yet, they've been opening the drawer for a few years, and the change seems to be stacking by itself. You can throw it in and turn around the next second, and it's all stacked in there, all nice and neat. In the search for proof, investigators test Tony's favorite table with a magnetometer. They're looking for abnormal levels of electromagnetism. Oh my God, it's going off the scale. No, right as I was coming over here, it went off the scale. It went up to about 100. Unlike other hauntings Lloyd Auerbach has investigated, the people here aren't frightened. One of the bartenders told me that she had pretty much gotten a couple of guys who were very drunk out of here and come back in, and she didn't lock the door behind her, which she thought as an afterthought. It turned out to have locked itself. And according to eyewitnesses, Tony is not the only ghost that haunts the Banta Inn. From what I have been told, Margaret was an old regular in the 50s and 60s. She passed away. She died of a heart attack in the building, and uh, that she absolutely loved the Ben, ben Ann. She, she, like, lived down here, and that she didn't want to leave either. Margaret plays. Uh, she, she likes levitation. Uh, she likes um, uh, throwing objects. The man came and ordered a hamburger, and the bartender asked him something about how he wanted it done. And at that moment, from across the room, where there was no one sitting, an ashtray picked up off the table, flew across the room, passed the guy's head, and dropped down in front of the bartender. Even Lloyd has experienced what seems to be Margaret's temper. The chandelier started moving by itself, and there's no way for that to have happened if the other one wasn't always already moving, unless somebody rigged it, and that's the first thing we did check. In another haunting case at the Moss Beach Distillery in California, a deluge of eyewitness reports warranted more sophisticated diagnostic tools. Yeah, what we're installing are three different types of motion detectors, an infrared detector, a microwave detector, and an ultrasonic detector. In addition to the detection devices, Auerbach has assembled a team of psychics who will attempt to make contact with the spirits here. You may have a lot of person witnesses, but no camera witnesses to objectify the actual phenomena that's going on. Photographic evidence uh, doesn't exist, and there are no good photographs, because we're dealing with a purely mental phenomenon where the ghost is somehow transmitting an image into your brain and bypassing the eyes altogether. Apparently, it was built as a residence to begin with. There was a garage downstairs, and then it became a, a booming uh, restaurant and a bordello, we think. There was a piano player here, and every evening, a beautiful woman wearing blue would come to listen to him play, and apparently they were having an affair. It, the only problem was that she was married, and her husband was very jealous. And one night, they were all here at the same time, and a fight broke out, and they ended up up on the beach 
and a stabbing took place and apparently the blue lady the lady in blue was killed and uh, then she came back here to haunt the place the blue lady is uh, quite comfortable with us and and we're comfortable with her um, we'll protect her I think as, as much as we can she pulls a lot of pranks um, I guess one that I can remember I is the funniest is that a waitress in the kitchen um, towards the end of the evening got smacked in the rear end with a spatula and there was nobody in the kitchen. We recently uh, installed a heating and air conditioning system and I spent uh, the better part of one day programming these uh, thermostats so they would go on precisely the time uh, pre-designated and so forth. The very next day I came into the restaurant uh, and every single setting in the thermostat had been changed and it would take at least 30 minutes for somebody to do that if you knew how to do it and if you knew how to unlock it. Coffee machines will turn on all by themselves and start dumping coffee out. At one point or another, I think everyone um, on our wait staff has heard someone calling their name. Um, I think it's just mischief. Um, she probably gets bored and likes to play a couple of pranks. Let us know that she's around. Despite their battery of detection devices and psychic input, the Blue Lady of Moss Beach did not appear during their investigation. But Lloyd Auerbach is encouraged by the data that has been collected. There is definitely something anomalistic or psychic or whatever you want to call it going on in this place. We can go in every few months, let's say, and we can ask if anything new has happened and start really getting a fuller picture. Is the lady in blue imaginary, or could her failure to materialize be just one of her pranks? I personally believe this is happening because I take a lighthearted approach, and since most people have a sense of humor, I think most ghosts do too. Thanks for joining us. For Sightings, I'm Tim White. Good night. Is Princess Di the victim of an uncaring and unfaithful husband? Are her alleged suicide attempts really a desperate cry for help? Next Friday, Fox takes you behind the closed gates of Buckingham Palace to uncover the truth behind the shocking rumors about Princess Diana. Di, prisoner in the palace. A Fox special next Friday after America's Most Wanted. Now stay tuned for Hidden Video.